If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of no fees. If you're on Xbox and need some gamer score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Retro, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last, sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Three two litre bottles of flavoured water from Iceland for £1.80. Can't argue with that. One of those a day, and that will help keep me going. Hello, my fellow today Saints, Kenzie Retro here, and welcome to the Trophy Achievement Podcast, the one stop shop for all the latest g- new gaming news, rumours, and of course, those sweet points and trophies at the end of the show. Not as jam packed a show as it normally is um, uh, every week. I just. Normally, I just go through the major gaming websites, uh, Polygon, Games Radar, Tech Radar, uh, GameSpot, IGN. But uh, I've actually had gaming news pop up on my Facebook news feed over the course of the, um, over the, course of the uh, last week. Uh, I'm recording this on a Wednesday now so that I can guarantee that I can get this up for my patrons on the Thursday. And rest assured, uh, I will still get this up uh, for the Friday as normal. But anyway, here we go. Uh, What do we have in store today? Uh, We haven't got, well, like I say, I haven't got much, uh, I haven't got much to, really uh, talk about um uh we've got news on PlayStation f- on the play on Sony's latest PlayStation um S- Xbox have announced when their press conference is going to take place at E3 news on Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and fans are not happy and neither is PC gamer for that matter uh we've got some Interesting news on Assassin's Creed Unity. Now, why I bring that up, I'll talk about that uh, shortly. Uh, and there's a Lion King version of Monopoly, which is which sounds fun. I like the idea. We'll, we'll talk about that soon enough. And in the points and trophies section, uh, yesterday at time of recording, World War Z was released in the US. So, I will be going through all 35 achievements World War Z. All that plus plus more coming up on today's show. Before we begin, as always, a big shout out to uh, my good friends over at Boomerang Rentals. I really need to start using that service again. Uh, but nevertheless, packages start from as little as three ninety nine a month. Sign up today, get a twenty one day free trial, and you get three free game rentals. There are no late fees. You can keep the game as long as you like, or keep it forever at a discounted price from the online store. You can play the latest games for as little as nine ninety nine a month. So if you're like me and you love your video games, but don't want to fork out sixty pounds every time a new game comes out, Boomerang Rentals is just the place for you. You save money and you get to play more games as a result. Once you start renting, you're gonna start saving. I can testify to this. I've used the service for over two years now, and my goodness me, the savings have been incredible. Boomerangrentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. And that jingle means we have got ourselves our gaming screw up of the week. Now, this is a very interesting article that I found on Daily Maverick. And uh, it's from Evo Vector, however you pronounce it. Uh, he's a columnist. And the author of Extreme Environment, a book on, on environmental exaggeration and how it harms emerging economies. He writes on this and many other matters from the perspective of individual liberty and free markets. He is seldom wrong. I mean, no idea what that means. I mean, one of my friends will be able to clear that one up. But anyway, this is the headline for the article. Video games causing violence is a ridiculous myth. Thank you, somebody else that understands this. Why will this issue just not go away? So, 
and this was written just last week on Daily Maverick, uh, April 8th, uh, so it would have been written last Monday. So anyway, the shooter who committed last month's atrocity in New Zealand joked that video games made him do it. He's right, that claim is ludicrous. It is no different from similar blame thrown at media throughout the ages, and now there is research to prove it wrong. Research has been proving this wrong for years. So, anyway. Christchurch Mosque shooter... Not the, the Christchurch Mosque shooter... This manifesto is full of trolling and in-jokes, some aimed to signal to like-minded racists who hang out on chan boards such as forward slash poll forward slash, uh, such as, such as poll, and others to provoke a reaction from alarmed media and politicians. In the course of his lengthy disjointed rant, which exposes him as an uneducated racist psychopath, Spiral the Dragon 3 taught me ethno ethno-nationalism. Fortnite trained me to be a killer and to floss on the corpses of my enemies. Oh my word, that is just horrific. The third Spiral the Dragon game was released up for PlayStation in the year 2000. The series was aimed at children and does not re and does not teach ethno-nationalism. Fortnite is an award-winning game released in 2017, featuring a very popular player versus player mode, in which one can floss, which is a victory dance move, much like Dabby, designed to show off. Its cartoonish style certainly does not depict realistic violence. Tarrant... He was laughing at idiots who say real-world violence is caused by video games, and proceeded to spew reams of reasons why he, in fact, did kill dozens of innocent people. They boiled down to the fact that he hated Muslim immigrants. Hmm. Every shooter raises every shooting raises once again the chorus that seeks to blame violent video games for the depra depravity of today's youth. It happened after Christchurch. Politicians blamed video games in 2018 after. 2018, after a shooting in Santa Fe, Pennsylvania legis legislators are considering attacks on violent video games. I mean, for goodness sake. Believing that this will help prevent school shootings. Wrong! The parents need to take responsibility for the games that their kids play. In the wake of the 2018 shooting in Parkland, Florida, the governor of Kentucky volunteered that it was caused by the culture of death that is celebrated in video games. TV, movies, and music. Donald Trump likewise blamed video games. Why am I not surprised? He's, a, he's the worst president in the history of ever. Because he is a businessman, not a politician. In 2013, after the Sandy Hook Elementary suit shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, a neighbouring town held a ritual video game buyback and burning. Oh my goodness me. It goes way back. After a school shooting in 2005, a professor of sociology and self-proclaimed expert on the social roots of school shootings told a news outlet that the shooting followed a video game script and that there was a great deal of anger brewing inside and murderous rage that is expressing itself in ways we all find quite familiar from countless video games. <coughs> The, Colum the, the Columbine high school shooting in 1999 was closely associated with video games since the shooters themselves not only claimed to play video games like Doom and Quake, but made lots of references to Doom before and during the massacre. Subsequently, Senate hearings were he held on the marketing of violent entertainment to children. If you're so paranoid about the marketing of violent video games and vi other forms of entertainment, to children, simple. Eth, simple. Show the advertisements after the watershed. What's so difficult about that? Why so difficult about that? Oh, goodness me. Oh, 
it's To take a page out of Peter Griffin's playbook from that one episode of Family Guy, this is really grinding my gears! Now, I would show... I would show the clip of that episode, but I was getting copyright claimed. So, here we go. What followed was a sort of witch hunt for everyone who looked like, dressed like, and acted like the Columbine shooters, which distressed a great number of children who did not conform to the norms expected of them from their parents and teachers. Again, this just proves the teachers and parents are not taking responsibility for what's going on. Some kids were actually placed into therapy over their identification with video game culture. Oh, for Pete's sake. Back in 1994, the games Mortal Kombat and Night Trap stirred up the moralizing and regulatory instincts of senior politicians, with Democratic Senator Joe, Joe Lieberman declaring these games are no mark of a civilized society. It's always been this way, as Louis Anslow wonderfully chronicled, complete with newspaper headlines from Timeline, Mother Grundy's and defence lawyers routinely seek to blame the latest media for the corruption of their darling children. In the 1970s and 80s, television took the blame for violence and murder. In 1957, the, young, the mother of a young defendant on trial for murder cited corrupting influence of radio serials. Before that, in the 1940s and 50s, comic books were the go-to culprits for juvenile crime. So this is not a new issue. This isn't, this isn't new. This thing isn't new. That would be like... That would be like... How do we do this? That would be the equivalent of somebody going out and... Going out, dressed up as Thanos, and killing half the town that they're in. Or half a... Somebody dressed up as Thanos, killing half a classroom of kids, claiming it will claim, claiming it will bring balance to the school. It just. I don't even have any words to describe. Right. Horror comics were banned in the UK in 1955. In 1948, the US saw a spate of comic book burnings after being linked to several murders. In, in the 1930s, gangsters were supposedly recruited from precious youth fed on poor cinema fare. In 1927, a double murder was blamed on radio, which made the killer feel queer inside. In the, in the late 19th century, attorneys for murder defendants often blamed dime novels for corrupting boys. For Pete's sake. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into the rest of the article, but you see my point. This is an issue that just will not go away. It's not exactly new. I mean, the late nineteenth, the late nineteenth century. Are you kidding me? In the late eighteen hundreds, for crying out loud. Something needs to be done to stop this from being the go-to thing. I mean, a mass shooting, a mass shooting is carried out. Oh, blame it on video games. I mean, back, I mean, I mean, back in the forties and fifties. I mean, well, like, actually, seventies and eighties. Somebody gets killed by um, somebody. Somebody gets shot dead. Oh, blame it on films and TV. Forties and fifties. A murder, a murder's carried out. Oh, blame it on comic books. Ugh! Again, this just shows that this just shows that people are not willing to take responsibility for 
what entertainment people are consuming. When there is research out there that shows the exact opposite, it's a joke. Video games causing, video game violence causing real world violence. When research has shown the exact opposite. It's, it really boggles my mind. And you just gotta ask yourself, why do these sort of people exist? Anyway, on to the main portion of the show. And you've got, uh, we've got details on the PlayStation 5. Details confirmed. 8K backwards compatibility, SSD, ray tracing, and more. Now, this is interesting because, here we go. This is interesting because Sony aren't going to be at E3 this year. But they've got this that they're working on instead. They'll no doubt showcase this at E3 next year. Anyway, here we go. You'll still be using discs to play games on Sony's next games console. Good to know. And it won't be landing until at least 2020. So we've got at least a year or two to wait. That's according to Mark Cerny at Sony, who is the lead system architect on the next gen console. In an interview with Wired, Cerny has confirmed the console won't be launching later this year, but he refused to confirm whether it will be called the PlayStation 5. Running off a bespoke version of the third generation AMD Ryzen chipset, 8 cores with the company's new Zen 2 microarchitecture, the forthcoming console will be capable of supporting ray tracing, a complex lighting technique that has so far been the reverse of in, uh, the reserve of incredibly high end PC GPUs. The chipset will also be capable of delivering a new gold standard in immersive 3D audio, particularly for those that enjoy playing with a headphone headset attached. One of the major upgrades here will be the integ integration of a bespoke solid state hard drive, which would work differently to how you can connect an SSD to your existing PS4. I'm predicting this will be two terabytes. I'm predicting this will be a two terabyte hard drive base. A base console with a two terabyte hard drive. Sony showed a demonstration of an early dev kit to Wired in the interview. During a game of Spider-Man, a fast travel loading screen took 15 seconds on a PS4 Pro. But the same task took under a second on the next gen dev kit, estimated to be some 19 times faster than a standard SSD in terms of read times. What? So that's going to be less than a second? What the heck? Essentially, you should expect your games to load a lot faster on this next gen console. That said, the integration of this technology may cost a lot, so there may be a price hike. Now that wouldn't surprise me. That wouldn't surprise me if that happened. But nevertheless, all the big details. Sony confirmed the console will still boast discs to play games and it will be backwards compatible with PS4 titles too. It doesn't look like it will support PS3, PS2 or original PlayStation titles though. But that doesn't mean the company will avoid the area of cloud gaming entirely or necessarily its vintage catalogue. Sony also said we are cloud gaming pioneers and our vision should become clear as we head towards launch. Whether that means an extension to PlayStation Now, Sony's current classic game streaming service, or an entirely different system remains to be clear. VR headset will work with the, fourth, with the upcoming console, Sony confirmed, but we'd also expect the company to release a next-gen version of its virtual reality headset in the future too. The upcoming console will support 8K to future-proof it for your next-gen TV too. Sony wasn't drawn on a release date for the console or a price other than to deny rumours of a 2019 release date, but we'd hope to learn more of those details when the company officially unveils the full console. The Wired 
The Wired article says Sony recently accelerated its development of dev kits so that game creators will have time the time they need to adjust to its capabilities. That suggests game developers already have the technology to play with, meaning we may hear more about the new console sooner rather than later. Which begs the question, why can we not get these details at E3? But then again, like I said, Sony aren't going to be at E3 this year. But hey-ho. What else can you do? Right. Speaking of E3, Microsoft promises its biggest E3 presence ever, just as Sony sits it out. So we've got an official time and date for Microsoft's press conference. I would love to be at E3 one day. Okay, Microsoft is promising its biggest E3 presence ever at E3 2019 and will kick off this year and it will... Oh! Okay! And it will kick off this year's Expo with the company's annual Xbox E3 briefing on Sunday, June 9th, 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 9 p.m. British Summer Time. Okay. So, so it's not going to be EA starting this year. Well, that makes a change. Anyway. Microsoft, uh, the Xbox E3 2019 briefing will stream live on the official Xbox Mixer channel, as well as other unannounced platforms. Expect Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook to all carry the stream. The Xbox team promises updates on unannounced titles coming in 2019 and in-depth looks at previously, unannounced, previously announced games during the press conference. Xbox's upcoming lineup includes marquee titles like Halo Infinite and Gears 5. We're also likely to get updates on games from the many studios Microsoft acquired over the past year. The company added Undead Labs, Ninja Theory, Obsidian Entertainment, Compulsion Games, and Playground Games to its internal studios over the past year, and founded an all-new one, The Initiative. There's also a very good chance that the that Microsoft will give our give us our first look at the next Xbox or heavily hint at what it's capable of, especially now that Sony has lifted the veil on the PlayStation 5. We're also likely to hear more finalized details on Project X Cloud, Microsoft's game, game streaming platform. Interesting. Microsoft will follow up Sunday's E3 keynote with a special edition of Inside Xbox, its streaming showcase for all things Xbox, Inside Xbox Live at E3 will air Monday, June 10th at 3pm Pacific Daylight Time, 6pm Eastern Daylight Time, which will be 1am British, uh, British Summer Time. And promises exclusive announcements, game demos, interviews, and more. Hmm. Is one of them going to be Ori and the Will of the Wisps? I know, I know I keep rabbiting on about Ori. Can you blame me? It's one of my favourite games of all time. Right. Now this one's from PC Gamer and oh goody gumdrops. People are not happy about uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Shock and surprise, this is EA we're talking about. Why should we be surprised at this point?
Anyway, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order's protagonist is such a wasted opportunity. Hmm. Right. Out of hundreds of cool alien species, this is the most interesting hero we spawned could come up with? Wrong, good sir. This is the most interesting hero EA could come up with. I never blame the developer. I always blame the publisher. The publishers are the ones that call the shots. You'd think EA would actually clean up their rights with the Star Wars license, but nope. There we go. This is what the article says on PC Gamer. Before Lucasfilm hit the reset button on the Star Wars canon, there were apparently more than 20 million species in the Star Wars galaxy. That number which I've pulled from Wikipedia, and that Wikipedia pulled from some Star Wars novel, Surely does not refer to an actual list of species created by Lucasfilm over the years. It's too many. Narrow that down to sentient species that have their own wiki page, and it's merely hundreds. Twi'leks and Mon Calamari and Solistans and Sock-Headed Worm People. In one of the Star Wars novels, I'm now only slightly embarrassed to have read as a teenager, a genetically modified Ewok with prosthetic limbs worked as shuttle pilot. Hmm. What I'm saying is, there's a rich, weird, silly, pretty awesome range of alien species out there for Star Wars creators to draw from, invented over decades of movies, books, and comics and games. And yet, this is the character Respawn has chosen as has chosen to lead Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Now, need we say more beyond that? Need we say more? Seriously? Where have I seen this guy before? Oh yeah, Solo! That Star Wars movie nobody asked for that spelt out a backstory nobody needed to know! Fallen Order's protagonist, Cal Kestis, looks like a knockoff young Solo. Even if he's based on actor Cameron Monaghan rather than Alden Ehrenreich. To quote executive editor Tyler Wilde, they chose someone with the personality of a hotel bathrobe. Ouch! Where else have I seen a character an awful lot like this? Oh, just in a majority of big budget video games made in the last 15 years or so, more or less. The hood, the clean jaw, the broody face. I can't remember the last time I was instantly bored looking at a video game protagonist. And the rest of the Jedi Fallen Order reveal trailer doesn't do much to bolster its flat lead. It's all cutscenes, so we get no real sense of how this game will play. This is EA we're talking about again. Why am I not surprised? And the voiceover, trust no one, trust only in the force, is a rote, see how delusioned we are? Setup? Maybe a brilliant actor could have instilled this script, but with more desperation or conflict or a tinge of hope. But I watch this and I feel, well, nothing. This is what, and just hearing all this just has me praying more and more every day that EA loses the Star Wars license and never uses it again. What a wasted opportunity. Of course, I can't say yet if Cal Kestis will be a narratively interesting character. We'll only know that in November when Fallen Order is out. Spoiler alert! I won't be playing it.
but I can see that there were so many visually interesting options that Respawn, EA, and Lucasfilm didn't take here. No, EA, EA again, and only EA. Because again, like I said, they're the ones that call the shots. And it's a damn shame. This isn't a movie where hours of makeup, close-up shots, uncomfortable costumes, and expensive CG are all barriers to making central characters aliens. This is a video game where the skills and imaginations of your artists are the only limitations. Unless you're working with EA. Surely this wasn't as far as that imagination could stretch. Now, here's a short tour of some of Star Wars' many, many alien species who could have made for more immediately interesting protagonists. Now, here we go. So you've got Togruta here. Looks like she's... I mean... I mean... Need we say more? I mean, from a t I mean, in Attack of the Clones and the Clone Wars series. That's where I've seen it before. Both hands. I mean, actually, this I like! I like this one! Many of them died to bring you this information. Exactly, yeah, I like it. Barabel, ooh. Looks like a lizard-like species. Yeah, lizard-like, there you go. Arcona, species known for being, for being force sensitive. Mm. One of the pops up. Ah, oh, New Hope Cantina scene. No, I'm not going to play the music because I risk getting copyright. Calibop. A Jedi Birdman. Okay, that's an interesting character design. I like that one. The Devaronians. Yeah, Clone Wars. Zabrak. Like Darth Maul, but on the good side. Mm. Fosh, eh? Okay. Might be a lot of bird people. <laughs> oh, I've got to test it. Okay. One, there might be a lot of bird people in Star Wars. And two, I freaking told you a bird, uh, bird man Jedi would be awesome. Mon Calamari. They literally, and he mentioned that in the article earlier. Uh, Mon Calamari. Yeah. Gotal. Oh, so, <laughs> okay, maybe not these guys. <laughs> I mean, Rodians. Um, species familiar to pretty much every Star Wars fan. With an expressive face and a history of Jedi representation in the Clone Wars series. Perfect. There you go. And, of course, droids. Who are some of the most popular Indian characters. I mean... I mean... I mean, opportunities left, right, and center there. And you go for the bland, generic, default creator character type in every RPG you've played. The blandness of Fallen Order's protagonist really stings when you hear that Uncharted writer Amy Hennig's cancelled Star Wars project Ragtag would have starred a group of playable characters, not just a single protagonist. And here's, and here's artwork for it. Look at that. That's what we could have had. But EA shut down Visceral Games and decided, let's ruin the license again. Absolute joke. And I'm not just saying that, it is an absolute disgrace.
I'm I don't even have any words. I just don't have any words. Right. I can't, I, can't, I can't finish the article. I can't finish the article. And I'm not just saying that, I genuinely can't finish the article. Now, a separate article, a separate article said, fans not happy that the hero's a white guy. That just, that to me, says that that article is branding them racists without even looking at the bigger picture. One of my good friends pretty much said it perfectly. Generation Snowflake. Since when did people get offended by absolutely everything? I'm, I'm being offended by the fact that people are being offended over absolutely nothing without looking at the bigger picture. Now, I mentioned that we've got news on Assassin's Creed Unity. Now, why do I mention that? Well, you may have heard earlier this week that Notre Dame Cathedral was on fire and the spire actually collapsed. And there have been numerous donations made to help with rebuilding Notre Dame. Now, Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed Unity may be used to help rebuild Notre Dame, which I find very interesting. I mean, here we go. By now, you've probably seen the pictures of one of the most iconic Paris Parisian landmarks going up in flames. A large portion of Notre Dame Cathedral has been gutted, but have no fear. Some billionaires have got together and donated hundreds of millions of euros to the world's richest religious organization in an effort to get the monument rebuilt and restored. But how will it all be done? Well, it turns out a helping hand could come from an unexpected source, Assassin's Creed. Notre Dame de Paris is one of the central landmarks in Assassin's Creed Unity and was painstakingly recreated in digital form. It's a near one-to-one -one digitized version of Notre Dame and the single largest structure to be found in Assassin's Creed Unity, set in France during the French Revolution. It took two entire years to model this cathedral alone, with level artist Caroline Muse explaining 80% of her entire development time on Unity was spent making Notre Dame look looking as accurate as possible. The cathedral was created to created down to the placement of each individual brick and as well as the of, as well as all of the paintings that were actually hanging on the walls. And all of that hard work could now find an alternative use standing as the most accurate, accurate rendition of, in existence of a, of a dissident building that is now ravaged by fire. Ubisoft's involvement has yet to be confirmed, but a number of parties are allegedly interested in lending their expertise to getting Notre Dame de Paris looking exactly as it should, including Ubisoft with Assassin's Creed Unity and historian Andrew Talon, who used Lanus scanners to map the cathedral in three-dimensional space. Talon's work is accurate to five millimeters. So between that and Assassin's Creed Unity, the restoration project has a strong base to work off. It's good to see something good finally come from Assassin's Creed Unity, eh? <laughs> oh yeah, quick jab at all the um, bugs it had at launch. Goodness me, that was like about five years ago now? 
if that. Now, I like the idea. I can get on board with it. I can get on board with that. I mean, if this does actually go ahead and Ubisoft get credit for this, I take my hat off to them. Now, here's something that will get Lion King fans um, excited. We've got the live action adaptation coming out on July 19th on the eve of the animated version's 25th anniversary. And now there's a Lion King Monopoly out with a nice juicy little extra in the form of a mini pride rock to blast out songs from the film. That is, I mean, the pride rock speaker, that is so cool. Anyway, as excited as we are by Beyonce being in the Lion King remake, we're just as jazzed to find out that the classic Disney film is getting a Monopoly makeover. The board game and the Disney movie, both family favourites, are coming together as Hasbro is launching Lion King Monopoly dedicated to the residents of Pride Rock. So you'll have Simba, Mufasa, Scar, Timon, Pumba, Zazu, Nala. I think realistically, Simba, Scar, Timon, Pumba, Zazu, and Rafiki. And there's your six playable tokens. So, let's have a look. Instead of spending hours fighting with your family and causing lifelong feuds over London properties, you could be doing it over the elephant graveyard or paying for wildfires. Oh my. And what's a musical without music? Unlike, to tr unlike the traditional game, the Lion King edition comes with its soundtrack played from a mini pride rock. I really hope they have the score as well, because the score is so good! The Oscar-winning film has been featured on a previous Monopoly version, but as a part of a wider Disney theme. It is, it's the first time The Lion King has a whole board game dedicated to it, as reported by Insider. Soon, you could play any one of the iconic characters, including Mufasa, Simba, Scar, Timon, or Pumba. What about, Rafi what about Rafiki and Zazu? You can expect plenty of artwork and quotes from the movie, which will have you feeling ultra-nostalgic. At the centre of the board is a giant picture of Mufasa, so you never forget who the true Lion King is. There is, There are interesting new concepts in the game, such as the circle of life and remember who you are, as well as Scar's famous quotes, life's not fair, is it? Which requires you to pay 50 Monopoly dollars. Hmm. You won't find houses and hotels either. Duh, we're in a jungle. So expect to see plastic beetles and grubs. Slimy yet satisfying. The railroads have been transformed into four animal herds. The rhino, elephant, antelope and wildebeest. Oh goodness me, that wildebeest stampede sequence. Oh my word, that's going to be interesting to see how they do that one. All cards can be put into the Pride Rock toy when, which when pressed, which went there. <clears throat> Actually, all cards can be put into the Pride Rock toy, which when pressed, plays the circle of life. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. That obviously requires batteries, batteries, but don't worry, the game comes with three AAA batteries. Oh my goodness me. Those that are super keen to call up their 90s loving friends will have to wait a bit as the game is only dropping in Walmart, store, Walmart stores for now. It will be available at Walmart from April 22nd at $40, which is just over £30, well, £30.62 to be exact. But there are plans to roll out to other stores in June. Are we going to get it here in the UK? Are we going to get it in the UK? I really hope we do. But nevertheless, we have got 
35 tr achievements to get through, all calculating up to the ever so famous 1000 Gamer Score! Yep. And that means only one thing, ladies and gentlemen. Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. Yep. And today, in the points and trophies, we have got World War Z. Which came out yesterday in the US. So here we go. I will... And as usual, when it comes to achievements, I will read out the achievement name, what it entails, and how much it's worth. But a lot of these are worth pretty much the same gamer score. So, the first set of achievements are worth 20 gamer score. And we have what the doctor ordered. Heal 30 teammates with health lower than 20% with health packs or stim pistol. A waste of time. Diffuse 10 mines. Veteran. Finish 25 PvP matches in any mode. Toxicomaniac. Walk into toxic clouds 100 times. There are many guns, but this one is mine! Open and buy final version of any weapon. Teamwork. Finish any level with a full team. Specialist. Open and buy all perks in one specialization. Salvation of the Motherland. Finish episode Moscow on any difficulty. Hope. Finish episode Jerusalem on any difficulty. Genocide. Kill 10,000 zombies. Friend of Machines, capture 15 turrets. First Aid, rescue 30 incapacitated teammates. Escape, fit, finish episode New York on any difficulty. Effective Communication, mark special zombies 50 times. Dispenser, dispense 10 explosive ammo packs to teammates. Can't fool me! Kill 20 lying zombies before they get up. Burglar, open 15 rooms or containers with breaching charge. <laughs> Builder, build 100 defenses. The next set of achievements are worth 35 gamer score. Winner in life, finish PvP match with high score in any mode. Walking bank, gather 200 resources during single match in scavenge raid scavenger raid mode. Scavenger raid scavenge raid mode. Torero, kill bull during charge. Olé! This is just the beginning. Finish all episodes on any difficulty. The most effective way. Finish any level using just a pistol. The floor is lava! Burn 10 zombies with one gasoline puddle. Strong immunity. Finish any level without using health packs. Sport kills. Kill lurker midair. Owner. Capture the point and hold it until the end of the match with in swarm domination mode. Madman. Finish 100 games in PvE. I am safe. You use masking grenade on three teammates when zombies are near. High caution. Finish any level without dealing any friendly damage. Explosive. Kill 10 zombies with balloon explosions. Chain reaction. Hit 10 zombies with one taser shot. And we've got three more achievements to... Uh, go through and they are all all three, all three of these last achievements are worth 50 gamer score. Well, what did you achieve? Finish all episodes on the hardest difficulty. Imposing Arsenal. Open and buy final version of all weapons. And Handyman. Open and buy all perks. That's all 35 achievements. You get all of those. You get not only 100% but you also get 1000 gamer score! And on that note, that is it, ladies and gentlemen, for this week's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Hope you enjoyed what you saw. If you did, as always, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized into following this channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the latest day season notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Previous video on the left, which is my review of Kim Possible. And on the right, my dedicated Trophy Achievement Podcast playlist. And I will see you guys again very soon. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day. Peace out, and as always, stay faithful.